Hello and welcome to Folks. Tonight we bring you to Angola, Louisiana's maximum security penitentiary. The reason we are here is to talk to two inmates who may have to spend the rest of their lives here. Our purpose is not to glorify these inmates, but to show the increasing numbers of young criminals what their life of crime may ultimately lead to. It's uh, the biggest maximum security penitentiary in the nation. It's uh, located in the most rugged, the most desolate region of the state, in the central part of the state, right uh, at the crook of the Louisiana boot. Well, Angola is Louisiana's maximum security prison. We've got approximately 4,200 inmates here, and uh, these are, for the most part, the long-term, uh, what some people might consider hardcore-type individual. This is the end of the line. The end of the line? Yes. This is where prisoners who are sent to Angola, those who have your long terms, uh, primarily your violent offenders, armed robbery, uh, rape, murder, narcotics. Uh, those are the offenders who primarily come to Angola. Most prisoners who come to Angola have sentences, uh, they have very little hope of ever getting out on. <laughs> Angola sits nestled on three sides by the mighty Mississippi River in Angola, Louisiana. On the outside, the 18,000 acres of rolling meadows and farmlands looks inviting. But inside the fence grounds, the stark reality of prison is a constant reminder to 4,200 men of the crimes they committed when they were free and the life they must now live as a result of those crimes. The physical conditions are not bad. You don't have, in, in terms like people used to think of prison, where you had deplorable uh, physical conditions, bad living quarters, bad working areas, uh, lack of medical treatment. It's not that. You have basically decent food. You have basically adequate medical treatment. You have uh, uh, adequate work assignments. You have good physical living quarters. So it's not a bad place physically. It's just that when you're here, you hear from now on. Billy Sinclair and Wilbert Rudeau have no illusions about the life they live. Both men, convicted of murder when they were still in their teens, have been residents of Angola for more than half of their lives. Five years ago, the men combined their talents and agreed to a pact that would tell the world about true life behind bars. The only experts you have in this country on prisons is those who have never been to prison. We teach uh, uh, courses in corrections in our universities. And the people who teach those courses have never even put one foot inside of a prison. Yet they say that they know how we think, they know how we live, they know how we do, but they don't, they've never even talked to a, a prisoner. Now the problem in the past has been between those two extremes. There's been a lack of understanding and also, and it's probably due to uh, the fact that there's been too little information. And what we try to do is, and I, th I think we've done it, we've succeeded in a lot of instances, you can solve a lot of problems if you can bring about, if you can provide more information about what the problems are, crystallize the problems for the people involved, for both sides, you create a certain amount of understanding. I mean, they can, you know, move toward each other and you automatically solve the problem. Through the prison's bi-monthly news magazine, The Angolite, Rideau and Sinclair have told stories, gotten interviews, and expressed opinions that have shocked many on the outside. The co-editors work out of an office in the prison's medium security section. With the help of a small staff, they know virtually everything that goes on in the prison, from the isolated maximum security cells to the warden's office. It allows the inmates to, to express their views and, and uh, the prison from, from their own perspective. And I think it's interesting reading for, for those not only in prison, but uh, many people on the outside of the prison that, that want to have an opportunity to look inside a prison and, and see what, what goes on. What we try to do is to use the Angolite as a medium to foster a better understanding of the prison community, and there is, a pr there is a community in prison. It has its own values, it has its own morality, it has its own standard of ethics, it has everything that a society, that a, that a community has out there in a free society. And what we try to do is, is 
in some way let the, 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 the free world reader see what prison is like as a community. We try to uh, give you a realistic view of what prison is like because everything in prison is not violence. Everything in prison is not death. Everything in prison is not uh, necessarily bad or necessarily good. It's like life any place else is mixed. We have not had occasion where a story just had to be killed because it was unacceptable. Uh, I tell the editors uh, that their, the journalism skill that they have, that they can write an article that's going to be acceptable to the inmate population, a story that they can live with, one that the administration uh, feels comfortable with, and one that the general public will feel comfortable with. And they have been able to do that. That takes a lot of skill. And nobody, nobody cares. You cannot control. I don't care how many guns you've got. I don't care how much power you've got. I don't care how much authority you've got. You cannot control 4,200 inmates and expect them to do what you want them to do. They're not just going to sit up here. They're not just going to waste away up here because you want them to because you say, who cares? They'll explode. They'll explode like they've exploded in New Mexico. They'll explode like they've exploded in other prisons across the country. And then you start caring, and you say, well, what happened? What was wrong? What the Angolite tries to do is make you understand before it's happened. Louisiana's never experienced the type of disasters and the type of tragedy they've had in other prisons across the country. And right now, every, every day you pick up the paper and you see about a new prison exploding, about inmates taking hostage, about inmates uh, rebelling, about inmates tearing up a cell block. They are going to forcefully make themselves known to you. It's good, it, it depends upon how you want them to make themselves known to you. They'll take over a cell block and burn it to the ground if that's the only option you give them. Through the Angolite, we've tried to give them a, a different option to, to project themselves in a different light to society. If any inmate in the prison gets special attention or extended privileges, Rideau and Sinclair do. Several times during the writing of an issue, they leave Angola with a guard to get supplementary interviews. Angola's administration has been criticized for the special status the editors receive because it could possibly be used by the two inmates as a key to get them out of prison permanently. Well, I think that, of course, the skill that they've acquired in writing uh, would certainly, I think, be favorable to them in any type of decision that's made regarding their welfare. They do, of course, want to get out of prison, as do the other 4,200 and, and some odd inmates. Uh, but I don't see that, I don't really feel that they use the Angolite in that sense. I think they probably would want to use the skill that they've developed, which I think that any inmate would have a right to use. The several attempts by both inmates to get paroled have been futile. Their home continues to be Angola. Now, having already served a combined total of 37 years, Rideau and Sinclair say prison isn't the same as it was when they first came. The general inmate population, their code of ethics, and free society's attitude toward offenders are creating an almost hopeless situation that even they won't write about. What are the kinds of stories that you won't print or you can't print? Well, we can't, we're not going to be able to print it. If some prisoner here kills another prisoner, we see him do it. We're not going to be able to go and say, that uh, John Doe kill so and so because because we'll get killed. We have to live in here. We have to live by the subcultural rules and norms of this prison like anybody else does because we don't have any special protective status. We live in regular prison population with all the other prisoners, and consequently we have to live by certain rules in there. Uh, we can know we can know of a, a say let's say a high level administrator who may be stealing something. We're not going to be able to say that. We're not even going to do it. We're not even going to attempt to do it because that is suicidal journalism. It is not objective journalism. We can only practice good, aggressive, open journalism of issues, of policy, of procedures. Uh, when you start talking about corruption and bias, whether it be at the free people level, whether it be at the inmate level, then you're talking about suicidal journalist, ju journalism in this particular context. Well, there's, there, there's no real, there, there, one time there's what they call a kind of code, which was basically the do's and don'ts of what you do in a prison community among inmates. There's really no kind of code anymore, but there are certain things that, that you cannot do 
and live in prison population. If you see someone who is in, actively involved in, in, in some kind of illegal activity, whether it's drug smuggling or whether it's dealing narcotics, and you know about that, and you walk up and tell the correctional officer, hey, I know that so-and-so is dealing narcotics, and he sees you do that, they're going to kill you. You simply can't do that and live among prison. Now, you may be able to write a note to your captain or to your major and inform on him through a, 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 a letter. You may be able to catch him in some private moment and tell him what so-and-so is doing. They have informants in this world just like they have out there in the free world. In fact, probably more so in here. But there's, there, there's certain do's and don'ts, even informing. You keep your informing on a sly, undercover, you don't come out and open it. If you come out and open with it, they're going to run you out of regular prison population. They're going to make you catch a lockdown cell, a protective cell. Some people would say, well, that's ridiculous. This is a, this is a high security prison mm -hmm. facility. How can people be killed in prison and get away with it? Very simple. They just walk up and kill you. You have 1,500 uh, security, you have 1,500 free personnel in this, working this institution, 1,200 of them are in security. You have guard towers all around this prison. They cannot stop one killing. The only way they can stop a killing is a, an, an informant gives them information ahead of time that so-and-so is going to kill so-and-so, and they can lock them both up for investigation. But if an inmate decides he's going to kill somebody in this prison, you can have, they have a, they have a free man in every dormitory. One of the last killings they had here, they killed him right there in front of the free man. What's the free man going to do? How is he going to stop another inmate from stabbing somebody? If he runs up there and tries to interfere, he's subject to get killed. The most he can do is hit his little bleeper, call for help, and a goon squad or a collection security officer is going to come running to the, to the area where the man has been killed, and all they're going to be able to do is collect his remains and carry it to the morgue. You have lived here quite a bit of your lives, probably more than half of it. What do you think of the, the men? especially the young men who are coming to Angola nowadays? They frighten me. They scare the hell out of me. Uh, you have two kind of prisoners in Angola today. You have the prisoners like Wilbur and I, who are part of the, the old school of prisoners, those who've been here a long time, those who live by a different value system. And then you have the younger prisoners coming in. They're mean. They're hostile. They're vicious. Uh, they're slowly taking over even the prison community. Their numbers are becoming larger and larger. Their attitudes and their values are becoming dominant. Uh, it's an attitude of hostility. It's an attitude of bitterness. It's an attitude of violence. It's, it's an attitude of anger. All the negative emotions that cause them to, to, to commit the kind of random, senseless, violent crimes that they commit, which put them in prison. And they even shock some of the older, more subtle prisoners. I mean, prisoners who are in here for murder, armed robbery. They even shock these guys. I don't know if you'd say it's society. You've got uh, certain subcultural pockets in society where these people are, you know, they're bred, they're raised, they're conditioned in this way of thinking. They believe that uh, violence is a legitimate response to anything that's wrong, anything they want. They, they believe in taking. Of course, like I told you earlier, you know, they, a lot of them, uh, they see this as the only option in life, you know, to take what you want. They grew up with jungle values. Information coming out of Angola through the Angolite is now mandatory reading for several criminal justice schools across the country. The 4,000 subscriptions for the magazine are divided equally between the prison and the free world. The Angolite and its editors have won more than a dozen journalistic awards, including the prestigious George Polk Award and the American Bar Association's Gavel Award. We've used the term many times about that it's a journalistic experiment uh, one that we wasn't sure would work we're not sure that it will continue to work it would depend on the people who are involved in it uh, whether or not it works and how they handle the assignments to them it's not something that would work in any institution anywhere in the united states it, it works only if the people who are involved in it uh, are able to make it work is it working now it's working Perhaps the one thing the Angolite proves, when men are locked away, their minds continue to be free. Tonight we introduce a new segment to folks called Reflections. With the help of Stephen Fauconnier, Marilyn Johnson, and Hank Watson, folks presents a collection of poems written by inmates. The Weight 
by Tommy Mason. The life I've lived was one of empty fun, and now my life of horror has just begun. Now I sit here with a long damn sentence, and these people don't hear my words of repentance. I'll pay a great price for this big mistake. No one will ever trust me just for trust on sake. It seems that the future for me will never come, yet the end I see is what I'm running from. All I ask is for a chance to live, but for me it seems that's too much to give. Now it's obvious that I've been a fool. Wouldn't life have been much easier if I just lived by the rules? Like some dumb fish, I went for the bait. Now all I can do is get ready for the wait. Autobiography of Harold Eugene Packwood. I have lived most of my years between the age of birth and my teens in Harlem and Newark, New Jersey. An only child. My father died when I was five from an overdose of hard work and being black. Death certificates said he died of pneumonia, but I know better. Mother worked hard did the best she could and gave the most she could. But my early years were a struggle. Did all the things Harlem kids do. Red man child in the promised land. Went to George Washington High School where it was discovered I was a rarity. I was a super intelligent nigger. Being smart was hip, but it didn't feed or clothe me. So I took to the streets because I wanted what white folks had. Clothes to put on my back, three meals a day, and whatever else I may have desired, which only money could buy. Eventually, I got caught up in drugs, because my life since the age of 17 has been a continuous nightmare of trying to find myself. I have been a drug addict, thief, con man, black Muslim, black nationalist, black panther, and black nigger. I am now only a black man struggling any way and anywhere I can to bring awareness to my people and to tell of the frustration, the sorrow, the joy, the history of the black man through my daily striving for blackness through my music and my writing. I would like to think I'm a black man who's a musician and writer, but above all, a man. Battle in the H by Tommy Mason. There's this place on the prison walk where warriors and gladiators do their talk. It's a language of diamonds and blue steel slung by men with more guts than will. Whenever they gather in the H to fight, another nigger sleeps at Point Lookout that night, a sight to see quite bloody and gory just for some man to become a prison story. A fight to the finish in Jim Bowie style that will leave another mother to weep for her child. It's how these men live, this cold prison law that frightens the weak and keeps society in awe. Their codes here are many, but their friends aren't any. On their pride is how they live, with only hearts of hatred to give. So when a voice yells, clown, catch the corner, we know another soul will soon be a goner. When they grab up their knives, we know without seeing two more lost their lives. When they battle in the H, only dead men survive. Just Thinking by Joe White. I want to drift along, sing along, get high off memories. I want to get to know just once more how it feels to be free. I want to rip and run, have a lot of fun, come and go as I please. I want to sleep real late. Give myself a break. Put my mind at ease. I want to go strange places, meet new faces, make myself at home. I want to reach behind, reclaim what's mine, forget I was ever gone. I want to stretch out my arms, air out my lungs, refresh myself within. I want to shoot my stick, string out me some chick, see if I've lost my touch. I want to call the shop, make some stops, go for broke if I must. I want to eat the best, leave the rest, belch and say amen. I'm going to pass up drinks, say no thanks, avoid all the trouble I can. Yeah, I want to do my thing, make my name ring, get out my system this, this inhibition. I don't know what I want to do, to tell you the truth. 
I was just thinking, just thinking. Thank you, Stephen, Marilyn, and Hank. Next in close-up, Carl Williams, athletic trainer at Southern University, continues with his Getting Into Shape series with Who Should Get Into Shape. Tonight we're going to talk about who should get into shape or who can get into shape. Last week, we asked you to take a look in the mirror, take a good long look, I asked, to see if you thought you should get into shape. Well, I think I know your answer. Yes, you should get into shape because all of us need to get into shape. There is no age limit. Children, young teenagers, young adults, mothers, fathers, grandparents, people with different kinds of problems, we all can get into shape. The only thing we really need to know in the beginning is to consult with our physician get an okay from him so we will understand exactly what we can and cannot do. From that moment on, you're on your way to getting into a good program of getting into shape. I think one of the things in America today that we could use is the family conditioning program. I think we're missing that in American society. If we could find a time and a place that the family could get together, we could do this very simply. It's not a lot of cost involved in the getting into shape. Oh, it would be if you go to the health spas, it might tax the pocketbook. But we are in trying times. We are in an economical time where money is tight. And it appears it's going to be tight for a while. So we can do things very economically by working out in the home, by working out in the neighborhood, at your local school, at the local high school track, at the YMCA, the YWCA. There are many places we can go and cut down on the cost factor. Use the same clothing that you have around the house. The clothing that you work out with sometimes would be good enough. The gym clothes that the children wear in school would be excellent for them to work out in. So you can see, we all can get together and really help our conditioning aspect. It's one of those things that everybody in America needs to do. Remember once again, it's economically sound because there's little or no money involved. And it's going to be very beneficial because once again, when the mind and the body is of soundness, we're going to have a good day at the office and a good day at the home. So until next week, think about these things and we're going to tell you some of the safety precautions we should get into and how to start a program. Thank you, Carl. There's a part of Louisiana many people call Hill Country. Associate producer Greg Mooring teamed up with Troy Dramus a few weeks ago and found life in the Hill Country hasn't changed much over a hundred years. Uncle Jim Watson married my father's uh, uh, sister, built this house here. And when, and when I was small, about, i say five years old, they had already moved this house and worked with that to another place, and I went there then. Mm -hmm. The first time I can ever remember being in the house then. Mm -hmm. But that was several years later. Mm -hmm. and, and my Uncle Adam Gillen, he lived in the house a long time. Mm -hmm. And then after then, well, my brother moved the house here when he married, and he moved the house here, you see. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about moving, did they actually disassemble it and come back and rebuild yeah, it? They, they just t they just tore it down log by log and put it back just like it was put up at I've first. Heard, I've heard yeah, that. and all this here, all this hewing here, you see all this old work was done at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know that. Uh, how, how far back does coon hunting? I know that you're a great coon hunter and you have some prize-winning dogs. How, how how many years have you been actually coon hunting? <laughs> well, I tell you. I guess we'd say ever since I've been in my father my daddy, he has helped me across the branch old big oh. Oh. <laughs> Was that kind of a sport when you was a boy? Oh, yeah. Like the coon hunt, it's been that way all yeah, year? Yeah, hunting been in my sport all the way through. I always did that. Really? Hey, can I understand that you got some of the old type chickens? I got some of all kinds. Chick, 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 chick. I got some. Uh, I got some of all kinds. And that's where I raised my chickens. Right, right on the yard? Oh, yeah, you see, they ain't off. I don't know take them up. <laughs> no, I've been in bad health, you know, I ain't been doing too good. Uh, 
That that that's a dog that I'm catching for right smart, but I ain't never ain't no nobody that pays price. Here's one made price on right here. Come here, Queen. That's that for me, Queen. Uh, 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 that is your prize winning female right there. Yeah, well I tell you. I ran that dog with some night champion, with some grand champion, with some they claim awful good coon dog. And uh, she had never been beat, but I take her to the uh, to Sour Lake, Texas. A fellow by the name of James Dorman, and I went out with a dog he had called Rango. Uh -huh. Well, Rango was beat her. Well, I've seen her three coons that the other dogs wouldn't tell you. Well, what, what is considered? How, how is a uh, ju uh, dog judged in competition? When, you, when you're in competition with other dogs, how actually do they judge a coon dog? Do you well, right out in the woods where the coons are? Oh, are yeah. A coon to lose no, uh-uh, uh-uh. You go out, right out in the woods, right out in the woods, and the dog gets first strike gets 104. The first dog strikes the first. Uh -huh. And then it's second and third and fourth. The fourth dog gets 25 cents. Uh -huh. It goes down at 175, 50, and 25. I see. Then what about when they tree? Well, I'm in a tree. First dog tree is a dog gets 100 points. Uh -huh. Then every dog come in. Uh -huh. But, but uh, uh, you suppose that you suppose when you declare your dog tree uh -huh. and he leaves the tree, you lost a hundred points. If you declare well, it, he loses that he leaves that tree yeah, before you yeah, get Yeah, and if he is the same way on strike. Here's three I got here. They just hay for it bone. Mm -hmm. They say here that's that they built them for old barn. When they built them there. But now this here he built in here. I believe uh, this building here must have been here, them logs right about, I guess it must be about, uh, i say 50 some odd years. That's a split log building. That's a split log. Uh -huh. Y'all another one just like it, you see. This chair here went into a drum, went down in a drum, and water was in it. Well, that's just where it kept it cool. That's what turned your steam into liquid. Uh -huh. And it went on through, and this chair in here went out at your drum, and you put something on it to catch your liquor over there. And this in here, when he into the drum, which, which we we use, or my daddy used, or what he called something keg, about a five or ten gallon keg, mm -hmm. and this went into it. Then it's a uh, 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 pipe come from his main drum where he has far on the where he's a ball in there, into this keg, and he'd always put about a gallon, half a gallon, a gallon of whiskey in this keg, and that steam would come out in here, and then it'd go out through here and go through here, and then it turned into alcohol. And you said he used this, how long did he use this uh, coil? Uh, he had this coil, I'm, I'm sure, about 20, 25 years. That he was making home brew. That's copper coil, isn't it? See, that's that's copper. Out of copper. Pure copper. Pure copper. No kind of toxic. Now, y'all used to have old Saturday night country dances, and I know you had, you had a crock hid out under a tree somewhere, didn't you? Well, that's, <laughs> that's what was the run of it. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> oh, Man. Is that what they call the good old days? I, I, yeah, you know, I, 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 I think person enjoy this stuff much better than they do now. You, uh, you an old fiddler or something? I play just very little. I can't play too much, but uh, you play a little I, fiddle. I, I, I fool a fiddle a little bit, and uh -huh. I play a French harp, harmonica.